Okay, welcome back uh, to the third week of this uh, course on life cycle assessment. So, we will start with uh, looking at some uh, environmental data collection, how the environmental data collection is done. If you remember from the last week, uh, we went up to how the risk assessment is done, toxicological information and all that. So, if you remember from the last video, we, I would mentioned that for everything that you need to do, you need to collect data. So, the first uh, uh, module or uh, maybe first two module of this week will be focusing on the data collection part, how the data is collected and how it is analyzed and uh, what are, what are the, some of the challenges we face, especially when we are looking at the environmental sample. So, environmental samples they tend to be not normally distributed, they tend to be mostly mostly log normal distribution. So, we will we'll talk about that. Uh, so, this, uh, this week uh, will be focusing on environmental data collection and then we also will look at uh, life cycle analysis methodology. So, after we collect the data, now let us do some LCA, we will do, we will we will show you several examples. So, it should be, it should be clear as we make progress. So, if you remember uh, like the first uh, like one, when you start doing any analysis, uh, if you have done a lab and I assume you must have done some uh, environmental lab. Uh, so, if you have done some environmental lab or even a history, uh, I would say uh, chemistry lab, you do some chemical analysis. So, the chemical analysis it is done with some procedure, there is some procedure associated with doing chemical analysis. And, uh, and if, you remember, if you remember last, uh, last video, we talked about that uh, for doing these kind of analysis, there is a standard method. Uh, there are a standard methods out there, which is used for doing a uh, the analysis of different uh, samples. So, in terms of the chemical analysis procedure, so let us look at them, uh, what are the different procedures out there. One is our direct chemical measurement, say if you have done uh, a chemistry lab, you must have done alkalinity or hardness. So, alkalinity, hardness, those measurements you are doing a titration. So, anything uh, direct chemical measurement is when you do a titration, where uh, you add some samples, you have a, you have a water in a beaker or uh, and then you uh, from your burette, you are adding your uh, um, uh, titrant drop by drop and when using uh, some color change, uh, which, which is known as indicator, you say that okay, this has been neutralized. So, this is the alkalinity of this sample, we can calculate or the hardness of the sample and those. So, that is the direct chemical measurement. So, titration is a good example of that or you can use a sensor, uh, sensor on an instrument, which is more common. You even the pH meter is a very common uh, like if you walk into any environmental lab, you should have a, they should have a pH meter, because that is one of the very basic parameters. So, the pH meter is a instrument. So, what these instruments do? It is like if you stick your sample, if you stick this instrument or so pH probe for example, in a water sample, the pH probe reads a data and then the data is transmitted into the receiver, which you have the bench top or you if you have a handheld and that receiver is synthesizing the data and gives you out the pH number. So, that is how these things uh, work, because there is a sensor involved. And I will give you some example of different instrument, which will make it more clearer. Or you may have some sort of chromatograph. If you have looked into any environmental lab, uh, there are different types of chromatograph out there. We have uh, ion chromatograph uh, for doing ions, anions or cations. We have uh, uh, gas chromatograph, uh, which is again used for uh, gaseous sample. So, there are different types of chromatographs used and the chromatograph as the name suggests, the chromatograph is uh, it is a it basically what you are doing is uh, the, uh, the chromatograph means that you are separating different chemicals. So, for example, when you work on IC the ion chromatograph, you put the samples you put, pass your samples through. So, this chromatograph what it does it is it so all the ion what, what what ions typically we look at if you think about anions we have chloride nitrate nitrite sulfide fluoride sulfate or uh, bromate so your chromatograph separates these different uh, compounds and then based on their affinity to the uh, column the different compounds come out uh, at a different time and that's called the retention time so chromatograph helps you separate this uh, uh, chemicals into different fraction so, before you go into any of these chemical preparation, you will have to do what is known as uh, sample preparation. Sample preparation, very simple English, you have to prepare the sample. 
uh, there may be some physical preparation or there could be some chemical preparation. So, we will look at that as well. So, if you look at this particular chart over here, you have a sample, uh, you bring your sample, you collect the sample, you bring it to your lab and then you may have to do some physical preparation. Physical preparation means you may have to mix it, mix it to get it more representative sample, you may have to dry it and uh, that is the drying is done or grinding. So, either grinding again makes it more uh, like a bigger surface area, better reaction. So, depending on the type of uh, analysis that you are looking at, you may have to either mix, dry, grind and there could be other as well. So, th these are some examples of what the physical preparation will entail. Then after you are done with the physical preparation, you may have to do some chemical preparation as well. So, here there are some examples are given acid digestion. So, what is acid digestion? Acid digestion is essentially what you are trying to do is uh, you take your sample and then you throw it in some acid, acid uh, like in a beaker with some acid in them. What it does, it breaks down all the uh, organic matter, the, or the organic bonds that you have. Say if you are looking at a soil sample and you are interested in to find out how much uh, lead is present in the soil or how much cadmium is present in the soil. Big soil has, there is a matrix involved. So, many times what happens is your soil will, uh, will have a matrix, uh, the lead or cadmium present will have a matrix with certain organic matter or should be some, some inorganic material present and when you put it into this acid, in the acid digestion step, what happens is those bonds gets released. So, now your, your lead or cadmium is in solution, it comes into the solution, in it is in the liquid, uh, liquid now and then you can take that liquid and analyze it in any of the instruments. So, similarly there are other uh, sample preparation like the chemical preparation method, we also do organic extraction. Uh, the organic extraction is done as you can see uh, on the on, on this particular uh, like on the chart, uh, we had acid digestion was one, then we have solvent extraction. This solvent extraction is where we mostly use it for the organic material, where we use benzene or uh, uh, benzene is used a lot and methyl chloride is also used, methylene chloride is also used uh, quite a bit. So, when we have this, uh, what we do is we have uh, say if you have a water sample, you let the water sample mix with benzene, the benzene what it will do is it will extract whatever the contaminants you are looking at say for example, TCE or PAH. So, benzene will extract these chemicals into the solution and then you take that solution, concentrate it in a turbo map and then put it through GC. So, that is how that can be analyzed. Other things is uh, done is on chemical oxidation. So, that is the last uh, you see on the last example shown on, uh, uh, on the chart is the chemical oxidation where you are oxidizing the chemical before it is. So, again chemical oxidation and acid digestion is kind of similar. Acid digestion is a form of chemical oxidation as well. Chemical oxidation if you remember the COD test is essentially a chemical oxidation test because it is a chemical oxygen demand. So, there if you, if you have done COD, you know that it is a potassium dichromate which is used as oxidizing agent and then it oxidizes everything, uh, every chemical present in there which could be potentially oxidized. So, once first you do the physical preparation, then you do the chemical preparation if needed and after this you take the sample to analysis and the analysis could be done in a different way. You could be either do a titration, you could have an electrode, you could use some instruments out there. So, there are different uh, way of analyzing it. And after you analyze it, you, you get the sample concentration, the certain milligrams per liter or micrograms per liter or milligrams per kilogram depending on what kind of matrix we are using. So, this is how predominantly the sample preparation analysis is done like a quick summary of that and then you take it to an instrument. Now, there are different instruments have been developed to measure concentration of pollutant in environmental sample. It depends on what kind of uh, pollutant you are looking at. If you are looking at ions, we have ion chromatograph. If you are looking at some gaseous pollutant, we have the gas chromatograph. If you are looking for heavy metals, we have atomic absorption spectrophotometer, we have ICP which is a inductively coupled plasma atomic emission spectrometer, there is a, a graphite furnace, there is a atomic absorption, there is also uh, like a GCM like ICPMS mass spectrophotometer, there is GCMS gas chromatograph. Mass. So, these are some of the example. There are lots more instrument out there which is used for uh, for analyzing of uh, different kind of uh, samples. So, many different instruments have been used uh, for measure the concentration of pollutants in the environmental sample. These instruments, they what they do? They give you a response. So, it, it 
gives you a response and based on the response that you get, you correlate with the amount uh, of this particular pollutant which is present in the sample. Now, the response could be either uh, increase in conductivity, that is one response used a lot, uh, that is what used in even IC. Absorbance of light, that is what AA does, absorbance of light, even you have, uh, if you have worked with any environmental samples, environmental lab you have been to, you know that uh, UV vis, like a UV spectrophotometer, like uh, the one of the company most popular is Hawk, but there are a lot of other companies out there, Perkin Elmer, Simarju and other companies which uh, makes a uh, spectrophotometer. So, a spectrophotometer it work again works on absorbance. So, that is why for the spectrophotometer, we do not uh, use uh, any colored sample in the spectrophotometer. If you are using a colored sample in the spectrophotometer, since it, it works based on the colorimetry, it, it's a becomes a problem. I think I will show you a picture in the next slide, which will make it more clearer. So, there are different types of response, either increase in conductivity, absorbance of light or even emission of light. Emission of light is what is known, what is used in uh, ICP and we will talk about that. So, this is a, if you have done any type of, any type of any kind of environmental work, environmental lab work, you will probably recognize what this graph is. This is your typical calibration curve where the response is linear. As you can see, the equation, uh, it is it's a straight line. So, the straight line means it is a linear, is not it? So, we have a linear uh, relationship. As you are increasing the concentration, the x axis is the concentration, the y axis is the response. As we are increasing the concentration, we see a uh, increase in response. And if you do a best fit line and then you get your r square value, if the r square is close to 1, you say that you have a good calibration and then when you go back, so if you go, if you look at to the uh, this particular graph, now this is your calibration curve. So, you made a standards, you made a certain uh, standards uh, say 1 milligram per liter, 5 milligrams, 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams just for example and then you came up with a base weight line. Now, you have an unknown sample, you have a sample for which you do not know what is the concentration, you run that sample, you get a response, the machine will get a response and then it will go to this particular uh, line and then say, okay, this is, uh, this is the response I see. So, probably for this response, the concentration is down over here. So, this is what you see as a concentration and since these days, most of these works are done by the, by the computer software, the number that you, uh, number that comes off is what you see is over at the concentration number. So, if you are within this calibration curve, that number is good, you can use it. Say if you are, if you had a concentration which shows up somewhere here, which is uh, higher than the calibration uh, standard that has been used. For that case, usually what we do is we will dilute this uh, sample and then we will bring it to this particular calibration range and then we will uh, do the, uh, we will we'll get that particular value out there. So, it is the different way of uh, uh, so, this is the way you could do your instrumental analysis. So, this is uh, and this is pretty much common if what kind of instrument you use, every instrument has to go through a calibration curve. One thing you need to be careful about that is what the standards that you make to make calibration curve and uh, that standard should be made very carefully because uh, if your calibration curve is wrong, that means your whole analysis will be wrong. Uh, it will it will take the wrong information as the correct information because your concentration is based on that line that you saw on that particular calibration curve. So, if your calibration uh, standards goes bad for some reason, then your whole data will come out to be a bad set of data. And the other thing like how to check whether this calibration came out to be okay or not okay, because for the unknown samples you do not know what the concentration is. So, what we do is we make some known samples. For example, if you go back and look at that particular graph, so if you look at this uh, uh, the response and this is the concentration. Now, if we if we make a known concentration, say if we if we if we, if we make a sample for which we already know the concentration, those uh, those samples are called calibration check sample because we have made this calibration curve. We want to check whether this calibration curve is is correct or wrong. So, we do not take any of these standards, because if we take these standards, of course, it will come out to be correct, is not it? Because we our calibration curve is based on these four standard points. So, we make a new standard, we go back all the way to the new, but like a, a uh, to the source of the chemical, we 
take it uh, from the standard bottle of the, the bottle that we purchased from the companies. So we take a sample which we know the concentration. Now we run that sample as if it's an unknown sample. So it will give it a response. Then you go to the calibration curve, you look at the concentration and this concentration should be the same concentration that you made your sample for. If the concentration is different, that means there is a mistake there is a mistake in the calibration curve or there is some instrumental error. So, we need to go and fix that error and then redo the whole analysis again. So, those are the things you need to be very, very careful in terms of the instrumental analysis because as any, any calculation you make is based on the data that you have collected. So, the data quality is very, very important and as you will see when we go in that LCA exercise, getting good quality data to do environmental analysis is a big problem today. If you think about uh, we are these days we have a lot of focus on uh, this uh, such a Bharat mission or uh, we are building toilets, but at the same time we have been uh, like focusing on waste management. Right, right now I have been uh, I am doing some work uh, with uh, Bihar government on their uh, uh, waste management plans for uh, several ULBs. We have already done it for 35 ULBs and uh, we have to do possibly around another around 100 ULBs more we have been worked, we will be working on in the coming years, uh, in the coming basically months. So, most of the places what, what we see is that lack of quality data. So, if you are designing something, if you are designing say waste management system, if you are designing a water, water treatment plant, if you are designing a wastewater treatment plant, if the basic data is not correct, if the basic data quality is not maintained, of course, the product will, will have a some, some sort of shortcomings because uh, if your data is not say if, as a civil engineer, if you are a civil engineer, you want to design a beam, but you do not know how much load that beam will take, how much load the beam should, should take. Uh, you do not have that information very clearly, you only have a range. So, what will happen? You will end up either over designing or under designing and then you will be in problem later on. If you are over designing, yeah, it is a waste of resources, waste of money, but again structurally you are safe, but if you end up under designing your building may collapse. So, those things, uh, so that again the data is very, very important. Similarly, in the environmental area, say in the waste management sector right now, say if the city wants to go for a compost plant, but they have to first look at what kind of food, what kind of waste they have. Is the waste good enough for a compost plant or a anaerobic digestion plant? Will the anaerobic digestion plant will really work? This is all this the, the decision is based on data and if it is not a primary data, mostly it is a secondary data, but if even if it is a like secondary data, many times if you know it is a, a poor quality data, your whole calculation may go haywire and you may end up having a lot of problem. And we already have seen this kind of problem happening with uh, many waste management uh, activities that have been planned and implemented in many cities across uh, the country. So, coming back to here again, so data quality is very, very important. So, that is why I have been emphasis on again and again that you need to look at this uh, calibration curve and the data that you generate very carefully. That is uh, that is one of the critical aspect. Now, when you once you have your calibration, when we talk about the instrumental analysis, this is just one example, the spectrophotometer, which is a very, very common uh, instrument. You walk into any environmental lab, you will see they will have a spectrophotometer uh, for running the sample. So, the spectrophotometer what it does, it measures the absorbance of light at a specific wavelength. So, here you see a picture of a spectrophotometer. So, you have this is the box where you open the lid of the box, you stick this sample in there and what happens is the light passes through that based on the absorbance as, as you can see different color. This, this are, these are the sulphide samples and higher uh, the color, more the color density, higher the concentration in this case. So, this is our blank, so very clear like a double DI water, DDI water or a nano pure water and then you have uh, this is this sample has little bit of sulphide, this has very high sulphide. So, when you stick this sample in there with this, this uh, blank sample will, will clear the background, we will just say everything is uh, if it is uh, this color, uh, it is it's 0, 0 sulphide and then when you stick this sample in there, it will show some sulphide and this here it will show much, much higher sulphide and there is a programming method which is already there, uh, already programmed into this mini computer right there. So, this is how this, uh, so it works on absorbance of light. Uh, some 
some chemicals are directly proportional to absorbents based on the absorbents number it uh, the based on the calibration curve that we have done in the earlier with the standards we can uh, we can go back and uh, predict the concentration of uh, different uh, samples that we are doing so there are many many methods are based on this color change uh, or uh, using absorbents uh, it can be measured using so whatever the whatever you do using the color changes in titration can be measured using absorbents as well the problem with the absorbents uh, or this particular method is when you have here if you have a clear water sample it's good but if you have a sample which itself has color if there is a sample which itself has color then it becomes a problem because then you have interference coming in there so what i have been talking about is also relates to the qaqc qaqc is uh, quality assurance and quality control quality uh, control and quality assurance and we are talking about the quality assurance and quality control of environmental data that we are collecting from environmental samples so what it does uh, it's a qaqc qaqc procedures are designed to make sure the data you gather are sufficiently accurate precise and repeatable so it's a you are gathering accurate data you are getting precise data and you are getting repeatable data and how you ensure that there are certain mechanisms to do it we, we use blanks what is blanks blanks is your pure di water or nano pure water so this is a di water and nano pure water if there is no contamination of glassware no contamination of uh, say your instrument this blank sample should not show any concentration it should be all below detect so that's what we look at whether the blanks are coming out to be clean and if it doesn't come out to be clean that means we have some problem either we are uh, having some glassware and contamination issues and uh, we have seen that happen in the past say for example uh, this uh, happened few years back in my lab itself uh, where we were working with electronic waste a lot in those days and uh, maybe one batch of students were not that careful uh, once they did their stuff with electronic waste electronic waste lot of lead and then next day like after a couple of days we were using the same set of glassware the glasswares unfortunately were not clean very well so so when we are use uh, the soil samples and they almost all the soil samples even the clean soil which was the background soil which was supposed to be clean which were like a blank they also showed up uh, some lead there so that's the that's kind of problem shows up if the, if the that kind of problems can be easily detected if you have blanks if you don't have blank samples you cannot detect those kind of problem that's why you need the blanks to do that then the next you see next on that uh, three red bullets right that there next is the spikes now what is the spikes this is spikes is different than the spikes we talk about in the sportsman shoes this is these are actually spike samples so a spike we are spiking a certain concentration so what you do is you take your sample then add take another from the same bottle say if you collected a bottle of sample of a pond water or anything you take a sample as it is then you take another sample from the same bottle but at this time you add a known concentration of different analyte that you are measuring for so if you are measuring for heavy metals say arsenic lead cadmium chromium mercury whatever so you add known concentration of these uh, stuff in there now at the end when you do the analysis of the original sample and this sample with where you added the known stuff is called a spiked sample so when you have you are analyzing the original sample and the spiked sample and what you can do is you can take the difference of the concentration you get from the spike versus original like a spike minus original and the difference gives you the concentration uh, that you added so if you added the x milligram per liter uh, concentration the difference of the two for that particular element should be closer to x milligram per liter it will not be 100% so like it is uh, we call them recovery like if it's how much comes back Uh, it will not be 100% recovery for most of the heavy metals uh, we assume a recovery of around 90 to 100 90 to 110% to be very good 80 to 120% is acceptable if it less than that then we need to we need, we are worried we need to find out what's going on what what's the problem uh, for organics it depends on the type of matrix some organics we even are happy with 40 to 50% recovery some we want 70 to 80 percent recovery so it depends on different types of organics but uh, this recovery gives an idea whether the 
for that particular matrix whether the instrument is working okay or not. And then the last thing on that particular thing a particular uh, slide is what is known as replicates. Replicates as you uh, from the English word replicates means multiple samples. So, you have multiple same samples run multiple times. So, you have a same same set of samples uh, like if you want to run a sample then you run a duplicate of that and you run a triplicate of that to make sure the number are reproduced. You get the same numbers coming out. So, it is not uh, it is the same numbers which are coming back uh, in, in when you when you look at those. Uh, uh, so, that, that means the machine is working ok, your instrumental method is working ok. Do not worry too much about this particular slide, it is uh, basically uh, since as, as I said in the uh, some earlier video as well, uh, we will give you this uh, PDF version of this slides and you can read it over there. So, but it is basically it is a procedure, it is a procedure that the quality assurance quality control procedure needs to be followed when you are uh, when you are when you if especially if you want to become a good environmental lab. And for uh, there are certain like we call them uh, like a NELAC uh, national environmental lab accreditation council or government certified lab. For the government certified lab you have to follow many of these procedures. Some of these are like you have to have a standard operating procedure, you have to have a sampling strategy procedure, you have a sample custody, calibration procedure, analytical procedure, data validation, internal QC checks and all that. So, this is basically a project plan, there is list of different detail activity that needs to be done. Do not worry too much, just you can read it for your information. Now, when you are trying to uh, look at a certain instrument, any instrument has a detection limit. So, the instrument can detect only up to certain concentration below which the instrument may give you a number, but that number does not mean anything. So, that concentration at which the instrument can really detect that particular sample is defined as method detection limit or you can hear the term MDL. So, MDL is a minimum concentration of a substance, it is again it is from a EPA document, it has been taken verbatim from there. So, essentially copying I am quoting from there, it is a minimum concentration of a substance that can be measured and reported with 99 percent confidence that the analyte concentration is greater than 0 and is determined from analysis of a sample in a given matrix type containing the analyte. So, for a particular matrix type, uh, you are 99 percent confident that the analyte concentration is greater than 0 and it is can be determined. So, how we find out MDL? MDL is defined as MDL is T uh, which is your student's T table from the statistics uh, T n minus 1 and is the number of samples. So, n minus 1 is your degree of freedom and with uh, 99 percent confidence so alpha is 0.99. So, T value for this times your standard deviation of the sample data set. So, here T n minus 1 alpha is one sided critical T value at 99 percent level n is the number of sample s is the standard deviation. So, we can find out the MDL by getting the T value from the T table multiplied by the standard deviation. So, how we do it? Say for example, if you had a sample you ran 8, eight replicates of that and for that 8 replicate these are the values you got 12.11, 12.57. So, as you can see it varies from 12.02 to 12.57, not too much variation, but it's still it, there is a uh, some sort of variation over there. So, if for this particular element if you, if you want to find out what is the detection limit we have the 8 n is equal to 8, we can find out the standard deviation is for this data set. Uh, you can use your calculator and find out the standard deviation as 0.19. So, we look it up in our uh, like a t table for n minus 1 which has 7 and alpha is 99, the t value is 3. So, MDL is uh, t value times the standard deviation which is 0.19, so 0.57 milligram per liter. So, what does that mean is uh, that MDL it indicates that 0.7 milligram per liter would be the minimum concentration you can trust with the 99 percent confidence. If the machine is giving you like a 0 0.5 values, 0 0.45, 0 0.35, those values are not mean it cannot be trusted, those values cannot be trusted. So, anything below 0.57 we really cannot trust that number, anything closer to 5.7 also we need to be a little bit careful into dealing with those uh, number. This is an example of chain of custody like the form that you typically use when the sample is collected from a lab and taken to a uh, collected from a field and taken to a lab. 
we need to have when the sample was collected, who collected it, what was the some field parameters can be mentioned and what kind of analysis needs to be done. So, that is just an example of uh, that uh, st stuff. So, let us uh, for uh, for this particular module, let us uh, stop here and then uh, from the in the next module, we will look at some of the instrument that is used to generate the data. So, if what we what we did in this module, we talked about the importance of the data quality we talked about how the data is generated, we looked at the calibration curve, how the calibration curve concept works, what are the different different instruments are out there, what are what there and then the in terms of a spectrophotometer, we talked about that, how the absorbance reading works and then we also looked at uh, uh, in terms of the method detection limit, how the detection limit is calculated and how it is used in terms of uh, uh, in terms of the analysis. So, okay, let us stop uh, for this particular module and then we will is will come back and look at the second module where we look at those instrument which is used to generate the data. I hope you are enjoying the uh, videos so far and uh, thank you very much and look forward to seeing you again.